Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Introducing a new story called, We Just Wanted to Be Stronger. Credit goes to the amazing author, Asfari Dust, for his great story. Make sure to read the whole story by clicking the link tree link in the description, then clicking on the name of this story. This part will be chapter 1 to 5 of the story. Also don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe. Now let's get into this amazing story. Healed, to put something right, to recover spiritually or emotionally, to repair or rectify something that causes discord or animosity. Inky blackness covered the village of Kanoha like a mantle. In every street, houses lay dormant, their inhabitants safely slumbering. In one of those homes, a light flickered on. A shadow in the window could be seen slowly moving back and forth in a restless manner. Across the hall, another room lit up. At the soft squeal of the protesting hinges, a door opened, and a woman entered the small, brightly colored orange room where the copy neem paced. Kakashi stilled his aimless movements and gave his wife a self-deprecating look. I couldn't sleep. I got lost in my thoughts. I am smiled gently. Stop worrying. You know he will be here soon. It's been two years. Yes, you've waited a long time. Give it one more month. You're right, he agreed with a small sigh. Glancing at the small bed which lay in the corner of the room, he said, It's just been so quiet without him. I know. What was I thinking? You were thinking that it was a wonderful, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for him, and that it was time for you to let go. She noticed the letter crumpled in his hand and added, He'll be all right in time. You must believe that. Kakashi didn't answer. He just gave a small shrug and looked out the window. Although she knew that gesture meant that he didn't want to talk about it, she pressed on. He's twelve, a genin, an adult by shinobi standards. He's twelve, a child by a father's standards. He is feeling such horrible guilt and sadness, he snapped harshly. I'm sorry, he said quickly. It's just, just, waterfall. They said at the same time. She strode over to him and took his hand. Come back to bed. Hopefully, he should arrive soon. There is nothing we can do until then. When he comes home, we will be here for him. We will help him heal. He allowed her to lead him out of the room. At the threshold, the copy neen halted and took one last look at the battered and dinged walls and toys that lie scattered all around before snapping off the light. We really should clean this room, he commented. I am just smiled. She had been hinting at that for two years. Across Kanoha in another darkened district, another light was on. In the kitchen of her home, a mother sat alone holding the first letter her child had written in the last month. Just like the boy that wrote it, it gave nothing away. He didn't mention his feelings of failure or guilt. But Makoto knew they were there all the same. She knew her son, both of them. Sensing the silent approach of her eldest son, she wiped the tears away and tried to stuff the letter in her pocket. Itachi's hand covered hers gently and withdrew the letter. This will not break him, he said, opening the letter and nodding towards it. It had to happen sooner or later. It is fortunate that it occurred while they were under the guidance of the Sani. I just wish I could be there for him right now. He is so young and Waterfall is so far away. I can't help but feel that this is tearing him apart. Itachi sat down next to Makoto, took her hand and caressed it. You were with him, mother. You gave him the will of fire and it burns brightly from within. While he may be young yet, he is a true Uchiha. She gave her son a shrewd glance. I know this is hurting you just as much as it is him, my son, and yet you comfort me. You have always been closer to him than I could ever hope to be. Thank you. Go back to sleep, mother, said Itachi softly. He will arrive soon. Sasuke would not wish to see you in this state. Yes, I know, kitten, Makoto agreed with a small smile. He hates tears. Itachi rolled his eyes and chided. He especially hates it when you call us that. In yet another section of Kanoha, another light was blazing. A crumpled letter was fisted in a young woman's hand as she furiously paced in circles around the tall scarred knee. I'm going to kill that bastard. How dare he expose my angel to this? Anko, listen to yourself, began the man patiently. The Sanin did nothing wrong. It was not his fault. He explained everything last month. Nothing wrong, she asked sarcastically. Nothing wrong, she shouted. Anko growled. He shouldn't have been anywhere near Waterfall. They should have come straight home after the islands. The Beaky tried to placate her again. Waterfall is a peaceful place. How could he have possibly known? Anko's eye twitched dangerously, which caused Ibiki to quickly back up. Well, you know, it used to be, he said defensively. When I see the perverted old fart, I'm going to rip off his balls and feed them to my snakes, then tear out his spleen and watch him suffer while I eat Dango. You don't want to know what I'll do with the sticks. You know I love it when you talk that way, Anko. 
Her eye twitched again as she saw the look on his face. Don't even go there right now, she snarled. All I have to say is that my little angel had better be okay or Jiraiya is a dead man. Yes, agreed Abiki with a sadistic smile. He vividly remembered the way Sai was when he first adopted him. There was no way he wanted to see the boy in that state ever again. He rubbed his hands together and said gravely, and I'll help. Across the land of fire, the legendary Sanin, Jiraiya, the great toad sage, awoke with a start. His heart was drumming as though the hounds of hell were chasing him. He wiped the pouring sweat from his brow and shakily got to his feet. He paced around the room in confusion, trying to recall what had scared him so badly. With no recollections of any nightmares, he shrugged and decided to check on the boys before going back to sleep. He had acquired adjoining rooms at the spa, reported to have many beautiful women staying here, just in case he got lucky. He frowned sadly at his empty futon before quietly opening the door and peering inside. The moonlight shimmering in through the window gave enough light to see the three futons were occupied by the slumbering boys. Jiraiya heaved a great sigh of relief. While the futons were still spaced very closely together, the boys were no longer huddled together, lying there like poor abandoned puppies, like they had in the past month. It was the first time since Waterfall, and their eyes have finally begun to show signs of life again too. Jiraiya was very grateful for that. He went back to his futon and lay down again. There was no way I can bring the boys home the way they are, he thought to himself with a shudder, the way they have been since the incident at Waterfall. Naruto began to jerk in his sleep. His dreams still pursued him with a relentless intensity that petrified him. He couldn't get the betrayed, accusing faces to stop haunting him. They went with him everywhere, day and night. The people of Waterfall. Sai curled up in a tight ball. A small whimper escaped his lips as that same dream began to start anew. The same dream he had every night. The battle at Waterfall. A single tear streamed down from the corner of Sasuke's eye as his nightmare slowly devoured him again. No matter how many times Jiraiya told them all that they were not at fault, he saw the devastation again and again. He wasn't strong enough to protect them. Waterfall. Boom. An incredibly powerful blast of heat roared past above them. The air was sizzling hot and impossible to breathe. It scorched their throat and lungs. Their clothes didn't offer any protection either. The heat licked at their skin, even through their jackets, shirts, and pants. They didn't dare raise their heads until about 20 seconds later. The massive two-story stone house they had been standing next to no longer existed. All that was left was one wall that had survived by some kind of miracle. There were flames still roaring and licking the stones. A broad spiral of black smoke was rising up into the sky. What kind of jutsu could do that and who did it? We should really get out of this area, yelled Sai. His soot and mud-covered face couldn't quite conceal the tension that hovered around him. This is getting too dangerous for us to handle. A building might fall down on us. But what about Raya? We can't leave him, shouted Naruto stridently over the deafening sounds of the surrounding battle. And what about all the innocent civilians around here too? We can't just abandon them. Jiraiya is a Sanin. There is no way we will leave him. I want to join in his fight, interrupted Sasuke while gesturing towards the ongoing battle. What about the civilians? yelled Naruto again. We should evacuate the village and assemble everyone at the mill. Sasuke gritted his teeth at possibly missing the fight. Fine, but we need to hurry, he grudgingly replied. They each went in a different direction, urging the people to leave the area until it was safe. When they gathered as many people as they could, Sasuke said eagerly, let's take off the seals now and join in the fight. Should we not stay and protect the villagers? asked Sai with concern. They'll be all right here. There isn't anybody around to harm them. They're all fighting Raya, replied Naruto quickly. Come on, I want to try out my new jutsu. I can't help but think this might be a bad decision, said Sai quietly. Come on, Aho, bad decisions make for really good stories, joked Naruto. Sai ignored the funny feeling in the pit of his stomach and followed his brothers into battle, confident in his abilities. He had to admit to himself that he was a little eager to. He was a shinobi after all. They set out towards Sanin to aid in the battle. He had moved out of the village and was fighting at the top of a steep hill. There appeared to be only one left, a shinobi wearing a black robe with red clouds. Two years ago. I'll make you proud, Dad. Kakashi watched them depart with Jiraiya. You always have, son, he said to himself. For ten minutes, he stayed rooted to his spot. Everyone else having left, staring at the last place he saw his son. A small flash of yellow appeared in the distance and Naruto was back in his arms, wrapping his whole body around him in a hug like the type he gave at four years old. 
I love you, Daddy, he said softly in his ear. Goodbye. Love you more, son. He squeezed him tightly and with much regret, said, goodbye. Naruto jumped out of Kakashi's arms and swiftly ran to join his friends and godfather once again. He didn't look back. When Naruto caught up with everyone, there were tears in his eyes. Although he tried to hide his misery, the quiet sniffles gave him away. Sasuke was beginning to feel a little sad as well, but was able to squash the urge to join in his blonde-haired friend's depression. It's not that he wanted to cheer him up, he just didn't want to hear him blubber like a baby is all. Are we there yet, Jiraiya-sensei? He asked with a smirk. No, Sasuke, we just left. One hour later. Are we there yet, Jiraiya-sensei? A small smile graced Naruto's lips while Sai just looked confused at the Uchiha's questioning. Why is he asking that? Buttercup? Is he not aware that it will be many months before we reach our destination? Whispered Sai. He knows, Naruto responded quietly. Jiraiya answered. No, we will be traveling until dusk before we stop and make camp. One hour later. Are we there yet? Jiraiya-sensei? This time both Sai and Naruto snickered behind their hands as Jiraiya's face grew red. It's not too late for me to turn around and take you home, GKI. Got it. Shutting up. He looked over at Naruto and watched as his face grew melancholy again. I can't believe I'm going to do this, he thought to himself. Naruto, you owe me so big. Sasuke began to sing under his breath. Everybody stand up. Today's the best time to get up. Sai joined in. Before my eyes you still don't stop, Speed Hunter. Everyone is a victim to that attraction. Yeah. Come on. Naruto loudly joined in the singing, everybody hands up. It's the highly anticipated heroes come back. Hold up your fingers and count down. Let's go. 3, 2, 1, make some noise. Jiraiya covered his ears and walked faster, but the boys kept his pace and sang louder. He gritted his teeth. Do you really have to sing? What? Asked Naruto. You don't like my singing, do you? I'll bet it's because you can't sing. Do you ever try to listen? Asked the sage. Listen to what? The sound of the world. Naruto cocked his head and listened. I don't hear anything. Jiraiya snorted. That's because you're too loud and moving around all the time. Try sitting still, he said wisely. Naruto tried to be quiet. He really did. That lasted for exactly one hour before he asked. So what kind of awesome jutsus are you going to teach us? When are we going to start? The Sanin took a deep frustrated breath. He counted to five, asked himself what the hell he was thinking when he decided to take the boys on this trip, and then said, not another peep out of you. All of you. Both Sai and Sasuke glanced at Naruto. They could see him practically shaking in effort to stay silent and contain his natural exuberance. Sasuke grinned to himself and winked at Sai. Peep. Sai gave a brisk nod in understanding. Peep. He parroted quietly. Naruto slapped his hand over his mouth with a giggle and walked faster, but he couldn't escape the peeps. Sasuke softly clucked. Brock buck buck buck. Naruto giggled louder. Jiraiya swiftly turned around to see three innocently smiling faces peering back at him. You're all a bunch of animals, he muttered. As soon as his back was to them, Naruto shouted gleefully, M O. Cited a very good imitation of a cat in heat while Sasuke just smiled. His job was complete. For the next several hours, the Sanin tried his best not to strangle the excited little boys. He understood that they were just fired up from the novelty of the trip, but they were still driving him crazy. He finally found what he was looking for and stopped. He boomed out. Here we are, brats. This is a perfect spot to make camp. He pointed at a little clearing and told them to set the tents up and collect firewood while he hunted them up something to eat. Feeling too tired to bother with the tents, they listlessly made their way through the trees to find firewood. Naruto's keen nose found it first. Guys, come here. He said leading them towards a green pond. He tugged off his shirt, pants, and sandals and then jumped in without any hesitation. Man, this feels so good. Come on in. Join me. Sasuke quickly followed suit. In a flash, he was swimming lazily beside Naruto in the cold green water. Get in, Aho. He ordered the pale boy who stood hesitantly at the water's edge. Sai studied the water before responding. People should not be in contact with water that has a poor appearance. Blue-green algae can grow quickly and become very abundant and warm, shallow undisturbed surface water that receives a lot of sunlight. Both boys gave him a blank look before Naruto said. So what? The main risk to humans is microcystin. It causes skin irritations and rashes, but if the water is swallowed or airborne droplets are inhaled during swimming, bathing, or showering, symptoms could be worse. Those would include headaches, nausea, abdominal pain, seizures, liver injury, 
and respiratory problems. Sasuke rolled his eyes. You read too much, Aho. Yeah, come on, live a little, agreed Naruto. Sai wouldn't come in. Naruto reached between his feet with both hands, hauled up two great handfuls of mud, and threw them at the artist, hitting him square in the chest and splattering his face. With a look of mild irritation, he wiped it away only to be hit on the side of the head by Sasuke. He smirked at the dripping boy. Get in, aho, uh -huh. you are filthy. Well, I certainly am now. With a long-suffering sigh, Sai took off his clothes, neatly folded them, and laid them along the bank. He had the scummy water and commented, Judging by the color, I would hazard a guess that this is a breeding ground for bacteria and slimy creatures. Naruto deadpanned. What, you want to live forever or something? It's cool, wet, and feels great. And remember, that which doesn't kill you, will most likely succeed the second time. I don't get it. Is that supposed to be funny? Asked Sai. He gave one last look of longing at the shady tree where he would rather sit and draw before jumping into the pond. Naruto and Sasuke were right. The water felt great. Sai ducked under to rinse the mud out of his hair. He popped up with two handfuls of mud and threw them with uncanny accuracy at the other boys. Soon it was flying all over the place in an all-out war. Naruto looked at his friends, both painted as black as he was and laughed. We should probably rinse off and gather some wood like the pervy sage asked us to do, he said before ducking down one last time into the cool depths. When he came up for air, he swam over to where the other boys were getting out. Hey, you guys still have gunk on your backs, said Naruto, noting the black spots that dotted their bodies. Sasuke turned around and smirked at the blonde. So do you, Baka? As Naruto came closer, Sasuke's eyes widened in horror. He looked down at his own chest and lurched back in terror. His voice hit a high squeaky note when he screamed, leeches. Naruto and Sai looked down and calmly began to remove the leeches from their bodies and each other. Sasuke was tearing them off while whimpering. He suddenly became deathly still, and his face turned pale white. He pulled the waistband of his boxers out and stuck his hand down into them. He pulled out the biggest, fattest mountain leech the boys had ever seen. His hand trembled. Ah, 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 ah. He moaned before letting out a shrill scream. He dropped the leech on the ground and blasted it with a fire jutsu. Once the creature was fried to a crisp, he looked at his bloodied hand and fainted dead away. Naruto and Sai grinned at each other for an instant. They rolled Sasuke over and picked off the remaining worms. Naruto said firmly, Sai, we are never to mention this, ever. Sasuke is our friend, and he will never want to be reminded of this. No nicknames either. Yes, but what if he... No. Sai looked at Naruto questionably and asked, if you say so. Is that one of those things friends do? I have never heard of that rule in my book. It's in there. Believe me. So does that mean that I cannot tell him that the leech was bigger than his manhood? Naruto hid a smirk then frowned at the other boy. No, Sai, definitely not that. This is serious. He would kill you. Come on, let's try to wake him up. Sai opened his canteen and dumped its contents on the prone boy's face. Sasuke, coughing and sputtering, opened his eyes and glared. What the hell? He began before remembering. He jerked upright and shakily ran his hands over his arms and legs. Don't worry, they're all gone. We got them all, said Naruto, putting his hand on his shoulder. You sure? He asked softly. I promise. Thanks, he said, avoiding their eyes, both of you. Apparently, it is what friends do. If you ever get another worm on you again, I will remove it so that you will not be scared. Sasuke seethed. I was not scared. And that was no damn worm. Aho. It was a bloody leech. Sai was about to inform him that a leech was technically a worm when he caught Naruto's stern look. Of course, you weren't scared. You were just surprised, is all. I would have screamed like a baby if I found something like that on my nuts. Naruto made a shuddering motion and pretended to gag. Sasuke gave a small look of thanks then joked, Baka, it would have to find them first. Leeches don't like raisins. Ah, shut it, team. Come on, put your clothes on. I'm starving, and I'm sure the pervy sage is probably waiting on us by now. Ayam was cleaning out the closet when she came across a box marked Naruto. She brought it over to Kakashi and handed it to him. With a smile, he opened it up and showed its contents to her. Inside were some of his favorite toys from when he was small, pictures, and some clothes. At the bottom was a letter. Kakashi laughed when he saw it and handed it to his wife. I made him write this when he and Kibo were fighting as a punishment when he was around six years old. This was his first try. As you can see, I made him rewrite it. The letter read, Dear Kiba, 
My daddy said I was bad to kick you in the privates and that I have to write you this note to say I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry that you were a crybaby cause you hit me first. I still want to be your friend though. I know that this note won't make it up to you so here is ten whole Rio all for you. Cause I can't put a band-aid on it and cause then you can't pee. I hope you feel better in the morning, buddy. I promise not to kick you in the privates ever again if you promise not to hit me. Your best friend. Naruto. I am laughed until her sides ached then picked up the photos. One was of Naruto when he was three. A tear slipped from her eye as she gazed at the bruised and emaciated baby. Why do you keep this? It's awful. I have kept it as a reminder. I was so young when I adopted him. I knew absolutely nothing about kids or how to raise one. I never wanted to forget what could have become of him if there wasn't someone around who cared for him. Whenever I would get angry or frustrated, I would pull it out and look at it. It helped me find my patience when dealing with him. I am wisely said, neither one of you need this around anymore. You should get rid of it. He doesn't need the kind of reminder. Keep this one, she said, showing him a picture of Naruto sleeping in his bed with his teddy, Mr. Kumachan. Kakashi laughed. He took that thing everywhere with him. I remember the first time he ever used chakra to jump. He was playing by himself, must have thrown the bear up into the tree in our backyard, and went to go get it. He jumped up into the lower branches and then climbed up to the top. He got scared and couldn't climb down. I swear my hair turned white that day to see him clinging to that branch and screaming his guts out. He had nightmares every night for a week until he insisted that he climb the tree again and learn how to get down by himself. I don't think there is anything that can slow that kid down. A very irritated Jiraiya stood waiting when the boys returned with their arms filled with firewood. He took in their bedraggled appearances and laughed. You boys didn't roll in the mud, did you? I wouldn't suggest that around here. The swampy water around here contains nothing but snakes and leeches. You won't be able to bathe here. Now he tells us, muttered Naruto. Since you all are so slow, I'm going to show you how to improve your speed. Line up and sit down, he said as he gestured to a log. He opened his pack and began to rummage through it, pulling out an inkwell and brush. Are you going to write us a letter? Joked Naruto. Nope, but thanks for volunteering to go first. The Sanin lifted Naruto's pant leg and drew several symbols on his skin with the chakra-infused ink. He repeated the glyphs on the boy's arms as well before stepping back and nodding to himself in satisfaction. Naruto tried to stand up, but found he couldn't move. What did you do to me, old man? He yelled in frustration. Jiraiya chuckled. They're resistance seals. They slow your movements down so your body will learn to go faster. You are going to wear them for a week. Then you will take them off? Asked Sasuke. No. Grin the sage evilly, then I will make them stronger. But I can't even move, whined Naruto. Yes, you can. Concentrate. Sai studied the completed seals on his body and commented, I am of the belief that this may be some form of child abuse, Jiraiya sensei. Jiraiya just openly laughed while he drew on Sasuke. When he finished, he said, You boys go set up the tents while I make some food. But I can't even move, whined Naruto again. Yes, you can. Concentrate or you will be sleeping outside. Two hours later, Jiraiya's tent was set up. They were about to begin the second tent when the Sanin stopped them so that they could eat. The exhausted boys slumped to the ground and slowly crawled over to their bowls which sat steaming on top of a flat rock next to the fire. How are we going to do this? Asked Sai, nodding at the chopsticks. All three sat in quiet contemplation. Naruto's head jerked up, his eyes alive with mirth. Guys, he said gleefully, we need to ask ourselves. What would Kiba do? Why? Who cares? Murmured Sasuke sarcastically. What would he do? Asked Sai. This, answered Naruto, shoving his face in the bowl and eating out of it like a dog. He lifted his head, gave a cheesy smile, and encouraged them, try it. Sai shrugged his shoulders and copied the blonde boy while Sasuke muttered, uncouth heathens, as if in Uchiha would do such a thing. His stomach gave a loud grumble of protest. He slowly reached out for the chopsticks and picked them up with one hand and the bowl with the other. His arms moved with unbearable sluggishness. His stomach rumbled again, and his mouth watered at the tantalizing smell that was so close and yet so far away. He inched the chopsticks closer. Almost to the bowl. Can I have some more, Jiraiya-sama? Chirped Naruto. Suck up, thought Sasuke. Sure thing. He got food on the chopsticks. Me too, Jiraiya-sama. Apo. Almost to his mouth. Here you go, boys, boomed out the sandy. It fell off. Damn it, he screamed in his mind. His stomach gave an even louder rumble. Sasuke looked carefully around and wondered if his pride was worth it. His stomach answered for him when it twisted uncomfortably. 
His face turned bright red as he caught Naruto grinning at him. If you tell anyone I did this, I will have to hurt you, he said before he lowered his head and ate straight out of the bowl. Welcome to the dark side, Sasuke, laughed Naruto. At least we have food. One week later, Naruto sat around the fire contemplating the letter he had been writing all week. It had been one exhausting one, and he couldn't stay awake long enough to write a lot. He told his father of the leeches and the seals on his body. You would sure be surprised if you could see me now, Dad. Raya keeps telling us that we look like we're swimming in deep water because we move so slow. It takes forever just to move 10 feet. This trip will take us years if we can't figure out how to move faster. Dad, you won't believe what Raya did. He just now told us that we should use chakra in our arms and legs to move faster. I am spitting mad. He should have told us on the first day. It's been three days. Three stinking days. Anyways, we are getting our revenge. We stopped at a little village the other day and Sasuke found some passion flower and valerian tea. You remember when you showed me that, right? Anyways, I had Sai gather some dandelion greens and get a watermelon. We're going to make the pervy sage a nice little smoothie and thanks for all that he has done to us. He will never know what hit him. Here's a joke for you, mom and dad. They say the dog is man's best friend. I don't believe that. How many of your friends have you neutered? Love. Naruto. After receiving his new mission, Kakashi glanced in the direction of Ichiraku. There was no flag dancing playfully in the breeze. With a slight pang of disappointment, he went home to pack. Ayam was preparing for the lunchtime rush when she heard the wet sound of a bubble pop and a croak. Curious, she went to the front to investigate. There was a large, red toad sitting placidly next to the stand. Hiding her trepidation at the slimy creature, she asked, Are you from Jiraiya-sama? The toad gave another loud croak opened its mouth, and spat out a large package adorned with childish scrawl. She picked it up and ran inside to give it one in return. Throwing it into its mouth, she yelled to her father, Change the flag. It's from them. Ayam tore open the package and found the letter that was addressed to her and Kakashi. She stowed it in her apron pocket and put the rest behind the counter for their parents to come get. I'll be back in a little while, Dad, she said excitedly and ran home. Kakashi was just leaving the house when Ayam ran out out of breath and red-faced from her exertions. What is it? Is something wrong? No. Pocket. Letter. Naruto. She huffed while pulling it out and handing it to him. Kakashi put his bag down, sat on the edge of the porch, and opened the letter. After a few minutes, he laughed and handed the letter to her. That's my boy, he said proudly. I had planned on doing the resistance seals soon too. She read the letter then looked up at him with a question on her face. I don't get it, she said. What will that smoothie do? Well, he laughed, passion flower and valerian tea make for a nice strong sleep aid and dandelion greens and watermelon individually, will work as a mild laxative but together will give you a pretty explosive case of diarrhea. So when he wakes up, she said with dawning comprehension. Yup, he went there. He said with a smirk. Oh my, remind me to never eat or drink anything that boy makes, said I am dryly. He is truly gifted. One year and eleven months ago. It was one month since they left Kanoha and Naruto, and the others were still in the borders of the Land of Fire. So far, his trip had been long and boring. The pervy sage had yet to show him or the other two boys any new jutsu. He said that he wanted them to begin after they became. Accustomed to travel, Sai was secretly a little glad. He was tired. It was hard getting used to the resistance seals on his arms and legs, even after using chakra. Their first spar after removing the seals was a real eye-opener, though. Their movements were much, much faster. It was pretty late at night, but the full moon shed a great deal of light onto their campsite. Naruto sat next to the dying embers of the fire with a pad of paper in his lap. Jiraiya would be sending a messenger toad with their letters home tomorrow, and he had yet to write anything. How do you tell your father that you missed him with every fiber of your being and not worry him? How do you tell your new mother that you missed having her arms around you without coming off like a crybaby? Naruto scrunched his forehead in thought and then threw yet another incomplete letter into the coals, watching the newly created flames devour the paper greedily. The silence of the night was broken by the soft rustle of clothing and the loud rasp of the canvas tent being opened. Sai so sat down next to him and stared up at the moon. Neither said anything for a few minutes until finally, Naruto glanced at him and saw the tears slowly making their way unheeded down his cheeks. What's the matter? I think I may be sick he said without looking at the other boy. You think? What's wrong with you? Questioned Naruto concernedly. I don't know. I have never felt this way before. Do you want me to tell Raya? No. I'm sure it will pass. Well, what is it? You know you can tell me. 
Sai surreptitiously swiped his cheek with his hand and stared at the wetness with curiosity. I have never cried before. It feels strange. I have been having these odd feelings of longing, which are often accompanied by worry and, I don't know, maybe sadness. I do not understand why I am feeling this way. Naruto nodded sagely and answered the unasked question. You were just feeling homesick. Sai. I am? How do you know that? Because I am too. Tell me, what are you thinking about when you first started to feel sad? I was remembering how my father would always tell me a story before I would fall asleep. He would ask me to smile for him, then he would rub his hand on my head and tell me to have good dreams. I had become accustomed to it, I suppose. My mother would also come in, press her lips against my forehead, and whisper to me that I was her sweet little angel. Even in the moonlight, Naruto could see Sai's cheeks redden a little. It made him feel happy for his usually unemotional friend. Don't be embarrassed, Sai. I think it's cool that she calls you her little angel. My dad always calls me his little puppy. Believe me, that's way more humiliating. Naruto's nose twitched for a second, and his eyes flicked to their tent. You might as well come out too, team. I know you're awake. Sasuke boldly exited the tent with a huge smirk on his lips. Ah, the puppy and angel can't sleep. What's the matter with you two babies? Ah, shut it, team. Or should I say, kitten? You didn't honestly think I would forget what your mother calls you? Sasuke, did you? We've been friends for six years. He patted the empty space on the log they were sitting on and said, Come on, I know that you have been a little homesick too. Don't hold a grudge and just join us. The sneer quickly disappeared from Sasuke's face as he struggled to keep his head held high. He sniffed, I don't hold grudges. I simply remember facts, Baka. Whatever. If you're going to act like a turd then go lay in the grass. Naruto rolled his eyes at Sai and then ordered the Uchiha. Just sit down, team. You're no better than any of us. He threw his arm around Sai and said, Why don't you tell us something about your family? Tell us what reminds you of them. It might make you feel better. Snakes. Every time I see a snake, I think of home. Sai thought for a moment, and then smiled a little. There was this one time that my father really got my mother really mad. He was interrogating a female prisoner, and my mother thought he was flirting with her, so she made him sleep on the couch. When he woke up and pulled his blanket off, there were snakes slithering all over him. He yelled so loud that the neighbors called the camp. Naruto couldn't help it. He began to giggle at the mental picture of the famous Abiki Marino screaming like a little girl. He could definitely sympathize. She made her snakes attack him that one time because of a little prank he pulled. Pulling himself back to the present, he encouraged Sai. What happened next? When they burst into our house, my dad had already killed them all and was just finished bagging them up. My mother had slipped out so when they saw all the snake blood all over the walls and floors, they thought he killed her. They were trying to arrest him when she came in behind them and laughed. She said that if he ever thought about getting too friendly with another woman, she would chop up his snake. But Sai, your dad doesn't have a snake. I know, but my father's face sure turned green when she said that. TCH, snorted Sasuke, you are both such dopes. She meant the snake, he said pointing down. Their looks turned from confusion to dawning comprehension before finally changing to one of horror. Naruto nudged Sai. I'm glad my dad didn't marry her. She is one crazy kunoichi. Yes, she can be very scary when she wants. She would send them in to wake me up when I would not get out of bed, but still. I miss her. Father is the one I miss most though. He would sometimes take me to work with him. You never told us that you've seen the inside of that building. What's it like? Is there really a cage in the front where they hang the prisoners who won't talk? Is there really a rack where they stretch people until their guts come out? Asked Sasuke. Not in the front. It's just a bunch of offices. The cells and interrogation rooms are in the lower level, and father would not let me go down there. Naruto and Sasuke's faces fell at the disappointing news. They really wanted to hear about the famed torture and interrogation unit of the Black Ops. Naruto then pointed to Sasuke and said, It's your turn now. Tell us a story. I'm not telling any stupid story. Well, I can tell one then. How about I tell the rubber ducky story? Rubber ducky? Asked Sai with a little snicker. You had a rubber ducky? Oh yeah, that's a funny one. You see, one time when I was at Sasuke's. And oh, interrupted Sasuke with a yelp. Taking a deep calming breath, he said, Fine, I'll tell one, but not that one. You know what, Naruto? My goal in life is to hurt you, severely. Yeah, you keep saying that, team and one day I might actually believe you. Now tell the story. All right. Well, you remember our first day at the academy and what my father did? Yeah, I remember. It was something Naruto would never forget. When I got home, 
I was scared of my father. Itachi was so busy at Unbu, and he barely had time for me anymore, but he came home and took me to the place where we would play when he was younger. He taught me the shuriken jutsu I had been pestering him about. That weekend he took me hunting, just him and me. My father tried to stop him, saying it was a waste of time, but Itachi said that in Uchiha never backs out on his word. He wouldn't let my father stop him. It was a good weekend, the best. Is that it? Asked Naruto. I mean, there's got to be more to the story. We killed a boar. You're a boar. He laughed and nudged Sasuke. Sasuke just grunted and said, whatever. You tell us one, Naruto. Tell us what makes you think of your family the most. Well, obviously ramen for my mom, but what makes me miss my dad the most is whenever I see this scar, he said pointing to the fine white line that stretched across his bicep. Sai shuddered and Sasuke winced. How in Kami's name do you consider that a good memory? Asked Sasuke, you nearly lost your arm. Well, Naruto and Sai were sitting at the house waiting for hate to arrive and take them sparring. A messenger arrived a half an hour later with a note for the boys saying that he could not come because of a sudden mission. Naruto, being very bored, picked up his tanto and said, Come on, Sai, let's just practice in my backyard together. The other boy protested, But we are not supposed to use real weapons without an adult present. Don't be a chicken. It's better to ask forgiveness for doing something wrong than to ask and be told no. That doesn't sound right to me, Whiskers. We were specifically told not to do that. They wouldn't forbid us without good reason. Are you kidding, Aho? They tell us not to do lots of things that make no sense. We are not supposed to go swimming after we eat. We are not supposed to pee on the bushes at school. We are not supposed to pick our noses when we have giant boogers in them. The list goes on. It seems like every day my dad tells me something else that I'm not supposed to do. What about you? Well, my dad did tell me that I'm not supposed to ask people if they are men or women. You've seen some of the people in this village, men with long hair and women with short. If I don't ask, then how will I know? There, you see. Still. Naruto ignored Sai's protests and dragged him outside. They began to spar before the inevitable happened. Sai slipped past Naruto's guard and sliced his arm through the muscle. As blood rained down, Sai ran screaming for help. Remember how Baisuk came outside and summoned my dad? He was so freaked out. His face turned white, and he grabbed me and ran all the way to the hospital. I kept trying to tell him I was all right, but it was as if he couldn't hear me. I guess I passed out because when I opened my eyes he was crying. I thought I was seeing things, but he really was crying over me. You were grounded to your room for a month, Baka. I still don't see how that was a good memory. Naruto smiled and couldn't quite keep the surprise out of his voice. He stayed with me the whole time. He didn't go on any missions. He said it was because he didn't trust me not to do something stupid, but that wasn't true. He stayed because he was worried about me. I miss him, but at least I know what I want to do. Sai, can you draw a picture of us to send to our families? If you want. And maybe, can you draw a picture of my mom and dad that I can have? Sai nodded. Sasuke stared off into the distance. He bit his lip then finally asked, Can you do the same for me? Kanoa, several days later. As Kakashi opened his letter, another piece of paper fell out. It was a beautiful ink drawing of Naruto, Sai, and Sasuke. With pride, he handed it to Ayam and finished reading the letter. He misses us, he said quietly. She took the letter and read it quickly. At the end, she giggled. He wants you to ask your Nien Ken if they think poodles are members of some sort of weird religious cult. Omake. Anko's Apprentices As the last bell rang for the day at the Ninja Academy, students came running out of the classroom, eager to go home and play. The girls in Iruka Yumino's class stayed in their seats, buzzing with excitement. Several minutes passed until the door opened with a bang. Sakura's mouth dropped as she eyed the kunoichi who strolled in. She was barely dressed. Do you see that? She whispered fiercely to Ino. Hey girls, I'm Anko. She's wearing... A shrill whistle was the only warning she got as a shuriken barely skimmed over her head, ruffling her hair, and shocking her speechless. I haven't given you permission to speak yet, Pinky murmured a chipper voice over her shoulder. Sakura slowly turned her head to see a second Anko holding a kanai and wearing a very evil smile. She gulped nervously and tried to prevent the irritation from showing on her face. She hated it when people called her Pinky. Since you like to talk so much... Why don't you tell everyone here what being a kunoichi means to you? Oh, oh well, she stammered. A kunoichi is a very beautiful female ninja who provides support to her team. Support? She asked disbelievingly. She looked at the rest of the girls who were all nodding their heads in agreement. She wanted to face bomb, 
and then she had the strong urge to plant her fist into the face of every instructor in the academy. Okay, first of all, Akunoichi is never support. Akunoichi is an equal member of the team, even if she occasionally provides support. Your job is to be strong, to be a leader, to be everything. Do you all understand? She continued, one of these days, most of the boys in your class are going to be bigger and stronger than all of you, just like most shinobi you will come across. And guess what? Most will dismiss you as too weak to even bother with. Anko studied the girls in front of her. Some like Ino and Sakura looked pissed. Good, she thought. She walked to the board behind the instructor's desk and placed three groups of pictures up. Pointing to the photos, she said, I want all of you to look at each collection and determine who the biggest threat is. Predictably, the girls chose the biggest male in each group. Anko shook her head disappointedly. She jabbed her finger to the first set. This is my mother. She was unboo. These men are civilians. Taking another set, she pulled the picture of a silver-haired boy down and held it in front of her. This is Naruto's father, Kakashi Hitaki. He was already a very lethal jonin when this picture was taken. The other men are only chunits. As Anko took another step to the last group, all the girls smirked. They knew they got this one right. It was some of the boys in their class. Anko instead touched the picture of Naruto. What? He's not the biggest threat. Sasuke is, protested Ino vehemently. He just cheats to win. Cheats? asked Anko. She leaned against the desk and listened with growing disbelief to the whiny little girls. He grabs my butt, she mumbled, red-cheeked with embarrassment. That's nothing. You all saw where he grabbed me, shouted another girl. He punched me in the nose, complained another. So, interrupted Anko, he distracted you, and he beat you. Is that what you're saying? At the muttered assents, Anko smirked. He sounds like a threat to me. And by the way, we are ninja, there is no such thing as cheating. Well yeah, but sensei, Sasuke can beat Naruto in a fight, so that makes him the bigger threat, said Ino earnestly. Hmm, is he really because Aruka's sensei tells me that he refuses to fight you girls? Apparently, the Uchiha brat thinks girls are not worth his time. That's not true, Sasuke is just a true gentleman, sighed a fangirl. Alright listen up, growled the now irritated woman. An opponent like Uzumaki who will fight regardless if you are strong or weak, or a girl, is much more dangerous. Plus, that boy never gives up and never backs down, something you all need to learn. So for today's lesson. She stood up and said in a loud tone, Boys, you can come in now. The girls blinked in confusion as the male members of their class filed into the room with ropes and cloths in their hands. Ino asked indignantly, Why are they here? This is a girls only class. Anko quipped, they are here to help me out. They meekly accepted the vague explanation and allowed themselves to be bound and gagged. When the last girl was trussed up, Anko gathered her belongings, walked towards the door, and said, See you all tomorrow. The young student's eyes widened comically, and many struggled against their ropes. Muffled shouts of protest halted Anko. She paused next to the closest captive, Sakura, and pulled down her gag. What is it? she asked innocently. Sensei, you can't leave us here like this. Why not? You left yourselves vulnerable. Well, because, because. Well, you just can't. We have to go home. Our parents will worry about us. We did as you said, Sensei. Oh, don't worry, she said breezily and put the gag back on Sakura's mouth. I already told your parents that you might be spending the night here at school. Oh, and one other thing. I never told you to let the boys tie you up. She gave an evil laugh and walked out of the room. The next morning, Anko was very disappointed to discover that all of the girls were still there and sleeping. She cut all the ropes and announced rather loudly, What kind of kunoichi do you girls expect to be? My son could have gotten out of those ropes in 20 minutes. Ino began to protest behind her gag. She jerked her body only to find out that the rope keeping her attached to the chair was no longer there. As she picked herself off the floor, she hissed in pain as her numb arms began to tingle then burn as they came back to life. Well. How are we supposed to get out? She asked waspishly. Ooh, there is this shiny, sharp object called a kanai that all ninja carry on them at all times. She replied sarcastically. But how are we supposed to know that you were going to do this? Asked Hinata timidly. Enko sternly addressed all the girls. That was lesson number one. The enemy won't tell you that he is going to capture you. You should always be prepared. Also, there is this amazing little thing that they teach here at the academy called the substitution jutsu. Our hands were tied to our sides, complained Ino. Lesson number two. The purpose of hand seals is to focus your chakra. The most difficult jutsu take a lot more seals. 
but the easiest ones such as what you were taught here at the academy take one. I can do those three with one hand. It will take you all a long time, but it will be worth it in the end. I expect to see you girls better prepared when we meet again next week. As the girls stood up slowly and painfully, Sakura turned to Ino and said, I'm scared to find out what the next lesson will be. Me too. My dad won't let me quit. Mine either. He told me that if I even thought of quitting, he would cut off my allowance and I wouldn't be able to go shopping, said Eno glumly. One year, nine months ago. And how are my precious little students, shouted a cheerful voice behind them. I have the absolute best lesson planned. It's going to occur sometime this week, so be prepared because I'm not going to tell you exactly when it will happen. You all will like my little temple. It's a real scream. With that said, Anko walked out of the classroom, leaving quite a few confused girls behind. Does that mean we can leave? Asked Sakura aloud. Well, duh, forehead girl, unless you plan on staying here by yourself. Shut up, Enopic. That sounds scary. Ah, she's probably just exaggerating so she can scare you, big baby. Well, I guess I'll leave too, stammered Hinata. Sakura was shopping with her mother in the market when it happened. Hinata was in the clan courtyard pressing flowers when it happened. Ino was finishing a delivery for the shop when it happened. None of them were prepared when it happened. Darkness. Whispers. When Sakura opened her eyes to the flickering candlelight, she discovered she was in some sort of subterranean cavern. There were stairs leading up to a heavy wooden door. Ino and Hinata were lying on their sides beside her. There was no one else there. Sakura walked up the stairs and tried the door. It wouldn't open. Whispers. Who's there? She called out timidly. Sakura? Where are we? Asked Hinata getting up slowly. I don't know. I wonder if this is Anko Sensei's new lesson. This doesn't really look like a temple to me, though. Then where is everyone else at? Dummy? Snapped Ino. Do I look like I know, pig? Shouted Sakura testily. Whispers. Do you hear that? Hear what? Whispers. Suddenly, Hinata heard the whispers, and her skin seemed to turn to ice in that instant. It was a wordless hissing, a soft sound, but growing louder by the second. She heard an echoing scream in the distance. That sounds like Sachiko, she said. And then she felt something crawling up her leg. She reached down, brushed at her leg, and knocked it away. Shuddering for some odd reason, she walked to the tiny candle, picked it up, and held it up high in the air. Roaches. Thousands upon thousands of roaches were teeming in the room. They were on the floor, on the walls, on the low ceiling. They were not just ordinary roaches, but enormous things, over three inches long, an inch or two wide, with energetic legs and especially long feelers that moved around anxiously. Their shiny green-brown outer shells appeared to be gummy and damp, like splotches of dark snot. The whispering was the sound of their endless, continual movement, long legs and quavering and tinny brushing against other long legs and antennae, relentlessly crawling and scuttling and bustling this way and that way. The girls froze. Sakura shakily brought her hand in front of her to make the ram seal. Release, she shouted. Nothing happened. Release. 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 Damn it. She shouted with a hysterical edge to her voice. Eno copied her. Nothing happened. Hinata focused her eyes and shouted, Be Akugan. They're real. They said in dismay as one. Sakura screamed. Eno screamed. Hinata tried to scream, but no sound came out. The roaches shied away from the candlelight. They were evidently subterranean insects that survived only in the dark. The three girls quickly realized this truth and looked up at the meager little stump of a candle. They heard another terrified scream in the distance bouncing off the walls. Sakura grimaced, that sounded like Momoka. The whispering grew louder. More roaches were pouring into the room. They were coming out of a crack in the floor. Coming out by tens, by scores, by hundreds. There were a couple of thousand of the repulsive, sickening things in the room already, and the chamber was no more than fifteen or twenty feet on one side. They piled up two and three deep in the other half of the room, avoiding the light, but getting bolder by the minute. Sakura and Ino whimpered helplessly. In that moment, shy quiet Hinata changed, like a butterfly emerging from its chrysalis. They are beetles, she said firmly. They are nothing but subterranean beetles. Roaches, insisted Ino. Hinata handed the candle to Sakura and grabbed Ino by the arms. She forced the petrified girl to look into her eyes. She said slowly, You listen to me. Nomanaka. They're beetles. They're only beetles. Repeat it to yourself, over and over if you have to. Ino nodded then began to chant, They're only beetles. They're only beetles. They're only beetles. 
She took the candle from Sakura's white-fisted grasp and said the same to her even though she was just as horrified as they were. They were still gushing from the hole, a writhing, squirming, putrid mass. They mounted up on one another, five, six, and seven deep, covering the walls and the ceiling, endlessly moving, swarming restlessly. The quiet whisper of their movements became a roar. Suddenly, the roaches moved toward them. The strain of them piling up on top of each other finally caused them to spill at her like a breaking wave in a roiling green-brown mass. In spite of the candle, they surged forward, hissing. The girls screamed and started up the steps. Ino pounded on the locked door, shrieking for help which did not come. They looked back down at the bottom of the steps. Just the sight of the humming mass of insects made them all gag with revulsion. They chanted together, They're only beetles, they're only beetles, they're only beetles. The candle sputtered. They're only beetles, they're only beetles, they're only beetles. The room below looked as though it was waist deep in roaches. A huge ocean of them moving back and forth and hissing in a way that it seemed almost as if it were one living thing down there, one grotesque being with thousands of legs and antennae and hungry mouths. The candle sputtered. They're only beetles, they're only beetles, they're only beetles. Behind them, the whispering in the dark cavern grew louder with each shattering thump of their hearts. Some of the insects were crawling up the steps despite the light. Two of them reached Hanada's feet, and she stomped on them. More came. The candle died. For a brief moment, the whispering seemed to stop, but then it grew even louder than before. Hanada felt a few on her ankles, and she quickly bent down and brushed them away. One of them scurried up her left arm. She clapped a hand on it, squashed it. Sakura, she said sternly, break that damn door down. A roach dropped from the ceiling onto her head. With a shudder of revulsion, she plucked it out of her hair and threw it away. Sakura screamed as she felt them crawling under her clothes. But, but, I can't. I've only been able to do it once. It's hard to focus. Ino continued to scream with her hands clamped over her mouth and nose to prevent the roaches from crawling in. Hanada slapped the pink-haired girl lightly. I believe in you, Sakura. You can do it. Now show us what a fine kunoichi you are and break down that damn door. Now. Abject fear was squashed as the fire returned to Sakura's eyes. She ignored the creepy, repulsive feeling of the insects touching her body. She focused her chakra in her hands, cocked her arm back, and slammed her fist into the door. It was reduced to nothing but splinters. Get them off, get them off, get them off, screamed Ino, stripping off her clothes and running in circles. Sakura began to sob as she took off her own clothes while Hanada calmly pulled off the roaches from their bodies. She then took off her own clothes and shook them out. She hugged both girls and soothed their terror. I hate that evil woman, wailed Ino while Sakura patted her comfortingly. I really don't like Anko sensei right now either, admitted Hanada with a guilty flush. What? shouted a familiar evil voice from above them. What do you mean, you don't like me? asked Anko. They looked up and saw her standing on a tree branch above them. She jumped down and pulled out a pocket watch. She clicked her tongue when she saw the time. How many times do I have to tell you girls to always be prepared? I mean, you could have easily picked the locks. The other girls managed to do that. Hey, we got out, yelled Ino. True, but what happens if Sakura isn't with you? What then? Hmm. Ino and Hinata looked down with a blush. It was true. Without Sakura, they would still be in there. Ooh, that reminds me. One group hasn't made it out yet, so I guess I should release them from the temple. She ran off with a cheery wave. Hinata, said Sakura timidly, you were the one who really saved us, not me. I just wanted to say, thanks. Me too, Hinata. I'm proud to call you my sister, added Ino, the both of you. Eighteen months ago, Jiraiya hurried through the chaotic streets towards the hotel where he and the boys were staying. He couldn't believe his luck. He entered the building and hurried up the steps towards their room. After unlocking and opening the door, he paused for a moment to gaze at the boys sleeping on their futons. So I looked as though he hadn't moved all night. He was lying on his back with the blanket neatly tucked around him. Sasuke's bed was almost as neat. He looked so innocent, lying there on his side with his palm tucked under his cheek. Jiraiya looked fondly at his godson last. Naruto, that was another story. He was lying across all three futons with his feet in Sasuke's face and his head on the other half of Sai's pillow. The Sanin swallowed a chuckle as he recalled what his purpose was. Wake up. He boomed out. All of you, wake up now. Come on, I need your help. All three were instantly awake, but made no move except to open their eyes. Why? muttered Sasuke, burying his head under the covers. You said that we were staying here for several days. Yeah, agreed Naruto with a huge yawn. 
He looked at the clock and gasped. And it's two in the morning, pervy sage. What's the big deal? Why are you waking us up now? I found her. You boys need to help me complete this mission. Found who? Murmured Sai sleepily. What? The lady that the Hokage asked you to find? Asked Naruto. Yes, said Jiraiya impatiently. That lady. She's here in this town right now. I caught sight of her in a casino down the street. So what are we supposed to do about it anyways? We're all just a bunch of kids, asked Sai while rubbing his eyes and sitting up. Nobody listens to us, and besides, I would rather sleep. With that said, he promptly lay back down, closed his eyes once again, and fell back to sleep. Me too, added Sasuke. Jiraiya looked at them in consternation before leaning down, grabbing Naruto's hand, and hauling him upright. You'll do, he said while dragging him out the door. But I'm not dressed for going outside, whined the blonde chibi. Jiraiya joked, it just makes you look cute and innocent. Hey, shouted the offended boy. I'm not cute and innocent. I'm a ninja. Yeah, yeah, just hurry up. The Sanin hurried the boy out of the hotel and into the street. Naruto was surprised to discover that, as hot as it was during the day, the night had turned downright freezing. He pulled his button-up pajamas closer to his body and huddled closer to his godfather in an effort to stay warm. He occupied himself by watching his breath come out in puffs. They turned down another street. It was lined with sleazy bars, stripper joints, gambling dens, and other places that were a mystery to him. He gaped at the bright neon signs and flashing lights that advertised peep shows and massage parlors. There were men standing around wearing brightly colored outfits. It suddenly occurred to Naruto where they were. The circus. Are you taking me to the circus? When I was at the academy, Sakura told everyone that her parents took her to one. She said there was an animal as big as a house called an elephant. I want to see one too, Raya. He excitedly tugged on the sand knee. Please, Raya? Please, 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 he begged. Look, there's even a clown, he said pointing to a woman wearing a lot of makeup and very little in the way of clothes. This isn't a... That isn't a... He sputtered and then amended, I mean, uh, you know what, maybe later. The meaning of some of the billboard come-ons at the worst bars baffled him. He asked, what do they mean when the sign says, get a peek at the pink? Are there girls in there with pink hair like Sakura? Can we go look at that? Um, yeah, never mind that for now. Just close your eyes, don't look at anything, replied the suddenly nervous man as he realized where he was taking the boy. He gripped the boy's hand with a firmer grip and said, stay with me, whatever you do. Jiraiya groaned to himself, Kakashi was going to kill him. Naruto's eyes bounced everywhere in fascination. Hey, look at that, let's go there. What's a full frontal? Uh, um, don't ask kid. And no, we are definitely not going in there. Please, please, please Naruto, just close your eyes Gaki. They passed a brightly lit place with flashing orange and blue bulbs and rippling bands of red and pink neon, where the sign promised live adult show. Really grossed out, Naruto cautiously asked, are there other shows where they have relations with the dead? He thought to himself that maybe he wouldn't mind staying cute and innocent after all. Jiraiya laughed so hard, he almost ran into a gawking bystander. No, no, no. Even this place wouldn't go that far. Now please, for the love of Kami, close your eyes. We're almost there. Naruto didn't listen. Couldn't listen. There was just too many fascinating things to see. He stared at the half-dressed women lounging against the building and the scary-looking men guarding the entrances and wondered at what they were doing. A young man stepped in front of Jiraiya, pointed at the boy and asked, Where'd you get that one? He put his hand on Naruto's face and caressed his cheek. Jiraiya hissed in disgust at the man's perversion. He yanked Naruto behind him, cocked back his arm, and punched him in the face. The man flew back, his body making a sickening crunch when he made contact with the building behind him. Hey, that was really neat, said Naruto as the man twitched. Can you show me how to punch that hard? The Sanin rolled his eyes, casually stepped over the body, and continued on without a backward glance, still dragging the wide-eyed boy. Some other time, Gaki. But what about that man? Don't ask, Jiraiya muttered grimly. The pulsating music from an open door caught Naruto's attention, and he turned his head to look. A woman was dancing against a pole. He tugged his godfather's hand and asked, Why do they do that? Who? Those women who do that, he said, pointing at the girl. They got a farm in a wagakir, Jiraiya said. Naruto gaped at him. He laughed at the chibi and said, I'm sorry. Sometimes I forget just how young you are. He squeezed the boy's hand. There are some things you don't need to know about yet but I can't tell you about other things. He blinked. 
Then there isn't a farm in Awagakir? No, or at least I don't think so, he joked. No, but seriously, some of them are slaves. Some are just poor women who do it to make money, and some do it because they want to. But why do they do it? Is it like my sexy jutsu and make men act funny? Yup, that about sums it up nicely. At last, they stopped in front of a large casino. Jiraiya handed the man in front some money and began to pull Naruto inside. He widened his eyes when he saw where he was going and protested, I'm not allowed in there. My dad says I'm not supposed to gamble or drink. He'll totally kill me if he ever finds out I went into a place like this. Believe me, kid, we won't tell him. Ever. Also, you are not going to be gambling or drinking. We need to talk to someone. Now keep your mouth shut until I tell you to. Jiraiya looked around until he found what he was searching for. He led Naruto over. Sonate, fancy meeting you here. You're looking as beautiful as ever. Jiraiya slid into a booth where a young, busta blonde-haired woman sat drinking sake. He indicated for the boy to sit across from them. Naruto rubbed his eyes and yawned wide then did as he was told. She seemed a little wary at seeing the toad sage but responded, Jiraiya, I haven't seen you in a long time. What have you been up to, you old goat? Oh, just passing through. She glanced at the boy with a question on her face. Naruto tiredly laid his face on the palm of his hand and closed his eyes. She finally said, I never would have thought this was your thing, pervert. It's not like that at all, Sonate. Look closely at him. Look at his face. I know you know it. This is my student, Naruto Uzumaki. Uzumaki, she peered at him in wonder and mouthed, Kushina. Yes, he said, bowing his head sadly. Kakashi has been taking care of him. He's not had an easy life. Jiraiya's face turned serious. Listen, Sonate, I've come to ask you to come back to Kanahagakur. Sensei is getting old and tired. He wants you to take the hat. Are you crazy? She shouted, waking Naruto. I swore there was no way in hell I would ever come back. Who wants to be Hokage? That's a thankless, horrible position for a thankless, horrible village. Only an idiot would do it. Being Hokage is the greatest honor, and if you can't see it then you don't deserve it, growled Naruto. Don't you dare insult the old man or my village. Why would you want her, pervy sage? What do you know about it, you little brat? She yelled back. Naruto slammed his hand down and growled. I know that I'm going to be Hokage someday, lady. I'm going to be a powerful, respected leader of the village. The unbidden images of her dead little brother and ex-fiancé flashed through her mind, causing pain. That's nothing but a stupid pipe dream, kid. Grow up and face the facts. The furious, insulted boy swiped his hand across the table, sending her sake crashing to the floor. A dream is not stupid. What's stupid is spending your life gambling and drinking. You're the one being stupid, granny. He doesn't mean any harm, Sonade. He's just a kid. His father would never forgive me if I let you kill him, said Jiraiya hastily as he saw the look in her eye. My sake, she growled. You're dead meat. In irritation, she flicked Naruto with her finger, sending him sailing across the room and into the bar. Bottles crashed down, pouring their contents all over the boy. He stood up and furiously marched back to her. You want to fight? I can take you. Bartender, bring me another bottle of sake, she yelled, and she slammed her hand on the table. A loud ominous crack reverberated in the now silent room. With a loud crash, the table split in two. The owner of the establishment hurried over. You owe me for damages. Pay up, and then all of you get out. Jiraiya pulled out his wallet and threw money at the man's feet. He grabbed Naruto with one hand and Tsunade with the other. Come on, he muttered. Let's finish this somewhere else. I'm not going anywhere with you, she yelled and yanked her hand out of Jiraiya's. I'm thinking this says you will commented the Sanin as he pulled a sheaf of notes from his pocket. He handed them to her. I've paid all of your debts in those villages, he said nodding at the paper. All I ask is that you give me the opportunity to change your mind. You travel with us for one year, and if you still don't want to go home, then so be it. I know that you would not like owing me. What makes you so sure that I will change my mind? I could leave right now. I don't, but Haruzan believes that a part of you wants to return home. He misses you. He looked deeply into her eyes and added softly, I miss you. Knowing that she had no other choice, Tsunade reluctantly said, Fine, I'll tell Shizen. She can go back to Kanoa for the year while I am with you. Naruto kept silent during the exchange. This isn't over, he thought. Naruto woke with the feeling of being watched. He cracked when I opened. Sai and Sasuke were looking at him in extreme disapproval. We know you're finally awake. Dobe, get up. He flashed them a grin then asked, What's got your panties in a twist, team? Sasuke's eye twitched. 
You went drinking with Jiraiya last night, didn't you? Don't lie. I can smell you. You smell like you showered in alcohol last night. Naruto sat up and rubbed the back of his neck in embarrassment. That's because I was. He ducked the punch Sasuke, sent him, and leaped on the Uchiha, wrestling him to the floor. I didn't break our promise not to drink like the pervy sage, I swear. A bunch of alcohol fell on me. Sasuke stopped struggling. You better be telling the truth or I'll kick your ass, Baka. Naruto let him up and then asked, What time is it anyway? Sai answered, Half past nine. What? Why didn't you guys wake me earlier? I have got so much to tell you. Do you guys want to go to the circus? It took half an hour of searching, but he finally led them to the area he had been to last night. It looked very different. The degeneracy was shocking to Naruto, who had begun to think of himself as experienced and mature since his travels began with the Sani. In the bright light of day, what was once flashy and fascinating was now dirty, run down, and frankly a little scary. Um, guys. I think I might have been wrong. I don't think this is the circus. I think we should probably get back to our room. Look, even Sasuke looks tense. The boy glared at Naruto for suggesting that he might be scared. I'm not tense, Baka. I'm just alert, very alert. He had a brightly dressed man who was walking towards them. The man looked very disreputable despite the harmless smile he sent towards them. Sasuke's suspicions proved correct several minutes later when the man began to speak to Naruto and Sai. Not lost, are you boys? He asked them. No, my friends and I are perfectly aware of our current location, replied Sai. Are you maybe looking for a little extra pocket money then? Money? Asked Naruto, perking up. Jiraiya was always taking their money to hold. We want money. What do we have to do? Oh, it's easy. You just have to make friends with some people I know. Sai commented, repeated exposure makes you like someone better and makes that person like you better, too. You're much more likely to become friends with someone if you see him or her often. Oh yes, I know of someone who would like to see you very often. All you have to do is smile and be a nice little boy. I have read that the amount of time you smile during a conversation has a direct effect on how friendly you're perceived to be and can help you make friends easier, added Sai. It might be a worthwhile endeavor to meet your friends so that I might practice creating new bonds of friendship. He started to take a step closer to the man, but Naruto and Sai grabbed his arms and pulled him back. No, Sai, you can't go with him, sighed Naruto, wising up. I swear I don't know how someone so smart can be so dumb sometimes. Yes, well, I'm polymerized tree sap and you're an inorganic adhesive, so whatever verbal projectile you launch in my direction is reflected off of me returns to its original trajectory and adheres to you. What are you saying? The weird man stepped forward and opened his mouth to speak. But before he could get out a word, Sasuke interrupted, We don't need your opinion. Now shut up and let the grown-up speak. He threw his hand in the air and angrily sputtered, Grown-ups, you're nothing but a couple of kids. I'll have you know. He didn't finish what he had been about to say as a shuriken whizzed past and pinned his shirt to the wall. What's worse, it happened so fast, he had no idea who threw it. He sang, Sasuke calmly continued as though he hadn't been interrupted, I'm rubber, you're glue. Whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you. Aho, uh -huh. you read too much. You kids are insane, said the man while he struggled to pull the deeply embedded shuriken out of the wall. I'm not crazy, said Sai. My father had me tested. They probably got the wrong results, sniggered Naruto. No, I do not believe so. My mother had me retested. The man internally debated with himself for several minutes. Indecision weighed heavily on him. There was something about these children that screamed, beware, but he had rarely ever seen an adult ninja, and never a child. He asked himself a question he would forever regret. What's the worst thing that could happen? He yanked the shuiken out and moved forward. Aho, uh -oh, can't you tell that something isn't right here? We're not letting you go anywhere with this man. Sasuke faced the man and sneered. We are not. Nice little boys. We are ninja. Yeah, sure you are. Well then, I'm sorry to say this, but my boss wants you three. You are coming with me. He looked over their heads and nodded at the men who had tried to sneak up on the boys. Naruto lifted his brow at Sasuke and said, Really? When he felt a hand clamp down on his shoulder. Sasuke snorted then muttered, Pathetic. Sai asked, So am I right in assuming that they are not looking for friends? Naruto put his hand on top of the large one that was touching him. Eh, they're just perverts. Let's teach them that they can't mess with the trilogy of terror. He gripped the hand, shifted his body, yanked hard, and flipped the man over his shoulder. Sasuke incited the same. 
Sasuke calmly walked over to the prone man and stomped on his hands saying, Don't you ever dare to put your unworthy hands on an Uchiha ever again. Naruto rolled his eyes. Team, you're not all that. It's okay if you disagree with me. I can't force you to be right. Sai interrupted. Perhaps you two should settle your quarrel later. In case you have not noticed, they are getting up. Well, some people never learn, said Naruto with a grin. Sasuke smirked at the men. If at first you don't succeed, you should destroy all evidence that you tried. Right, brothers? He began to form hand seals, but Naruto shoved him hard. No jutsu against civilians. You know better. Let's just kick their asses the old-fashioned way. Right, agreed the other two boys, leaping. They attacked with ferocity, pummeling the men until they couldn't move any longer. I told you not to touch us, said Sasuke to the cowering pervert who had approached them first. If you can't be a good example, then you'll just have to be a horrible warning. Sasuke gave a short, hard jab to the man's face. The Yakuza will not like this. They will get revenge. He squealed and covered his head with his arms. TCH, you tell them to bring it on. I'm not afraid. Me either. Nor I. When they arrived back at the inn, Sonade was there. She was drinking sake again. Naruto defiantly stared at her, still unhappy with her comments about the Hokage and his village. She glared back. Sai and Sasuke, surprised to see the normally happy-go-lucky boy looking so angry, asked, Who's that? That's the old hag who's going to be traveling with us. The one the pervy sage was looking for. HG, shouted Sonade, getting up and crossing the room. Just who are you calling an old hag? Well, you certainly aren't young, shouted Naruto back. He made the ram seal and transformed using the sexy jutsu. This is young. Sonade was not impressed. A vein in her forehead throbbed. She used her finger to flick him across the room yet again. Sai studied Naruto dispassionately for a minute before saying, You know it would have been more effective if you would have just hit him on the ears. Who are you? She asked sarcastically. I am Sai. So what do you want? Nothing. I was just saying that if you slap your palms down simultaneously over your opponent's ears, keeping your palms slightly cupped, you will create a pressure shock that can disorient your opponent, and in the ideal scenario, rupture the eardrum. Ending both his equilibrium and the fight in a single blow? What do you know about the ears? She asked sarcastically. Sai quoted, The human ear has three main sections, which consist of the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. Sound waves enter your outer ear and travel through your ear canal to the middle ear. The ear canal channels the waves to your eardrum, a thin, sensitive membrane stretched tightly over the entrance to your middle ear. The waves cause your eardrum to vibrate. Sai continued, were you also aware that the human heart has its own electrical impulse and it can continue to beat even when separated from the body as long as it has an adequate supply of oxygen? What are you, she interrupted, a human encyclopedia. There is no such thing as a... So do you know how to tell when someone is going into shock, she asked, suddenly very interested in the boy. The presentation of shock is variable with some people having only minimal symptoms such as confusion and weakness. While the general signs for all types of shock are low blood pressure decreased urine output, and confusion these may not always be present. Sanade looked back at Jiraiya, who had just joined them, in surprise. I think I like this kid. Maybe traveling with you all for a little while won't be such a bad thing. Shizen is a master medic now, and I wouldn't mind getting a new apprentice. Well, that's good. Listen, we really need to head out. He turned to Naruto and said, pull yourself out of that wall and stop playing around. Naruto shot him a dirty look. He brushed the dirt off his clothes and glowered at the Sanni. Jiraiya chuckled fondly at the boy before he turned back to the woman and continued, I really could use your help with a quick little side trip I need to make. Where? Takigakir, the village hidden in the waterfalls. Back in Kanoha, a week later. Anko stood at the counter at Ichiraku and read the letter with growing disbelief while Ibiki looked at it over her shoulder. Kakashi and Makoto were there as well, reading their own letters. Sakura just arrived to get hers when I am asked, is Sanade really coming back? Anko suddenly screeched. I'll kill him, she shouted. She shoved the letter at Kakashi. Read this. Kakashi's eye widened and turned cold. It's a good thing Sanade is coming back to Kanoha because we are going to have a little spar with Jiraiya when he returns. What happened? Asked I am. The boys visited a red light district. Sakura peeked at the adults and saw Makoto's eyes turn red and spin in their sockets. I am finger her heavy metal serving ladle, and a beaky scarred face changed to the most horrifying expression. She looked at her letter in confusion. He made no mention of a red light district. I'm having a great time here. I gotta go to the circus, and I saw four clowns try to take on three ninja. 
It was really funny. I wish you could have seen it. I didn't get to see any elephants though, but I did see this contortionist woman on a pole. I don't think I've ever seen anything like it before. Sai Sasuke, and I figured out a new way to mess with the pervy sage and Granny Sonate today while we were traveling. We tied dingle bells to all of our clothes and then we sang the whole 99 bottles of sake on the wall song. Three times. Yup, they sure were annoyed, but that's to teach them to spend the day in a bar, ignoring us. Can you believe that idea was actually Sasuke's? There's hope for him yet. By the way, when we were in the village a few days ago, I saw that they had dog food for constipated dogs. That blew my mind. I say that if your dog is constipated, why would you want to screw up a good thing? Keep them indoors and let him bloat. Jana. Naruto. The next day. As the last bell rang for the day at the Ninja Academy, students came running out of the classroom, eager to go home and play. Many girls in Aruka Yumino's class, however, went a different way. The school training field was their destination. With more than a little trepidation, they inspected the wooden teaching dummies that dotted the grassy area. They had learned the hard way that with Anko, nothing was what it seemed. None of the girls had ever seen a dummy that was so lifelike before. It was a tall man with waist-length, spiky white hair tied back into a ponytail, with two shoulder-length bangs that framed both sides of his face. Sakura stared at the dummy for quite a few minutes with a frown on her face. She couldn't put her finger on it but there was something very familiar about it. She thought that maybe she had seen such a man at the market before. The red lines that ran down from his eyes also seemed to tickle her memories and the wart on the left side of his nose was definitely familiar. Who was it? Sakura ran her fingers over the green short shirt kimono and matching pants before she finally asked, Does anyone know who this is supposed to be? I just know that I should know who it is. Hinata suddenly laughed. It's the Toad Sanane, Jiraiya. Sasuke told me all about him in his letters. Yeah, I think you're right, Hinata. Naruto says he calls him the pervy sage, she added with a giggle. So how is Sasuke? She asked in mild curiosity. Naruto mentions him occasionally in his letters. Oh, he's fine. He misses home sometimes, but he says he is getting stronger every day. He also said that Sai and Naruto are as well. Hinata hesitated. He says that Naruto talks about you all the time. He really likes you, Sakura. Yeah, I know. I mean, I know that he can be a real knucklehead sometimes, but he can be so sweet too. He says that Sasuke really likes you too. She said that without any rancor in her voice. After the fear exercise in Anko's temple, the girls spent a lot of time together. They found out the truth. Ino and Sakura were bitterly disappointed about Sasuke, but couldn't be mad at Hinata. The past several months with Anko had done everything to create an unshakable bond between the three girls, especially the more events. The temple was so horrifying, so traumatizing, and so extreme that they became the best of friends. There was no way she or Ino could ever harbor any bitter feelings towards Hanada. They were young after all. They moved on. I made a something, said the shy Huga softly. She opened her bag and took out three soft fuzzy hats. Sakura got a pink one, Ino a purple, and a blue one for herself. They looked carefully around for any of the enemy, aka a boy, and removed the current hats perched on their heads and replaced it with the new ones. Ino rubbed her head and moaned, I miss my hair. I still cry sometimes. You're not alone, Ino Pig. I miss mine as well. Hinata agreed sadly, me too. And how are my precious little students? shouted a cheerful voice behind them. I have the absolute best lesson planned. Ino cringed. Sakura whimpered. Hinata nearly fainted. Anko's face showed no surprise at the steadily decreasing amount of students that she met with each week. In truth, what had surprised her was the amount that stayed. She started out with 15 and was now down to 6. Hmm, she thought. I wonder if it has something to do with the fact that I shaved their heads three months ago? Well, I did tell them that it would help with their aerodynamics and wind shear reduction. Nah, it's probably just because the ones that left were weak, useless little fangirls. Then again, it could have been that little episode with my snakes. Nah, couldn't be that. After all, who would be scared to be locked in a dark room with a thousand snakes for a few measly hours? M. Anko Sensei asked Sakura when her teacher gave a decidedly wicked laugh. What are we doing this week? All of the girls' attention was now fixated on the table next to Anko. It was filled with an assortment of weapons, many of which they had never seen before. Ah uh, yes, girls, I have a very fun assignment planned for today. The girls looked at each other in weary acceptance of their doomed fate as their sensei began to lecture them about all the weapons. 
Anko picked up a short sword and walked over to one of the Jiraiya dummies. You all need to know how to defend yourselves with whatever type of weapon you come across. Some lousy, mouth-breathing, knuckle-dragging, worthless bag of beaver dung. Good-for-nothing pervert old hermit might try to drag you to places for which you are too young and innocent to be seeing. Eno-mouthed, worthless bag of beaver dung at Sakura and Hinata. They both shrugged and covered their grins with their hands. Who knows what that zit on the ass of life, continued Anko, putrescent mass of walking vomit, festering pustule on a weasel's rump whose life is a monument to stupidity, might do next, buy you a prostitute, ranted Anko without taking a breath. The girls watched wide-eyed as she ranted, that scum-sucking, perverted old geezer is probably a spineless little worm deserving nothing but the profoundest contempt. What's a prostitute? asked Eno. Sakura responded, Don't you remember the talk from last year? Oh yeah, the talk? I remember now. You yeah, that's so gross. But Anko sensei wouldn't that scum-sucking, vulgar maggot of an old geezer want to make us prostitutes? I mean, why would he want to buy us one? What would we do with her? Hinata and Sakura had to turn their heads to avoid having Anko see them laugh at the way Ino was trying to incite her further. Ah uh, yeah, that's what I meant to say. Anyways, that's why you need to know how to defend yourselves and really hurt that green-nostrilled, cross-eyed, hairy-livered inbred frog defiler so that he will never try it again on you or your sweet little angel baby. Angel baby? Who's the angel baby? asked Hinata. Sakura wasn't the class genius for nothing. It finally clicked. What got their sensei so riled up? The letter. Sigh. S.A.I. Marino, I asked your son. Suddenly she felt a bit stupid for not seeing it before. She had always assumed Anko was just another person who went to Ichiraka to hear I am read the letters Naruto sent. She had always figured that it was because the woman was a friend of his dad's. Sakura, explained Ino patiently, her name is Anko Mitarashi, not Marino. No, no, she's right, said Anko still pacing back and forth agitatedly in fury, she added. I'm married to Ibiki. I just kept my own name. That explains so much about Sai, thought Ino. Wait, you call Sai? Sai Marino from our class? Sai the artist? Your sweet little angel baby? Asked Ino disbelievingly. She shared a devious smirk with her friends then snickered and whispered, sweet little angel baby. La la, how cute, chorused the girls. I can't wait till he gets back and tries to call us hags or ugly again, exclaimed Eno. She rubbed her hands together with a devious look. Me too, agreed the other two. Ah crap, said Anko to herself. Girls, that was just a slip of the tongue. If I hear that that little faux pas of mine making the rounds at the academy, I might get a bit upset. As a matter of fact, I might get so upset that I might have to make you all do the fear exercise again. Everybody remembers that one, right? Eno cringed. Sakura whimpered. Hinata nearly fainted. Anko smiled. Ah, good. I see you do remember. Back to today's lesson. She pulled out a small battery-powered shaver and turned it on. The humming sounded so loud in the girl's ears. Does anybody want to guess what the losers of today's training receive? Every girl there shrank back and eyed the clippers with a touch of horror and resignation. But Anko sensei, our hair is finally starting to grow back, whined Sakura. Ah, Sakura, Sakura, Sakura. You don't have to worry about the hair on your head. The clan heads asked me not to do that again. Have I told you what beautiful pink eyebrows you have? Laughed Anko maliciously. Ino cringed. Sakura whimpered. Hinata nearly fainted. Anko walked over to the table and grabbed a short sword. She leaped at the dummy and began to hack and stab at its lower regions. Squeaking diseased rat. A mistake of nature. She then threw Kanai at the eyes and hacked the head off, while muttering, drooling inbred cross-eyed toe sucker degenerate spawn of a bandy-legged hobo and a syphilitic camel. When she stepped back from the destruction, all that was left was a pile of splinters. Does anyone know a good fire jutsu? She asked pertly while breathing heavily. Yo, I might know a few that are pretty handy. Kakashi, glad to see you accepted my invitation. Anko took a deep breath to calm down and finish her instructions. Girls, go get an assortment of weapons and have fun. I want to see nothing but kindling when you're done. Sakura walked up to the table to inspect the weapons. Something unusual caught her eye. It looked a bit like a kuzurigama sickle and chain, but instead it had a wicked curved dual-bladed knife attached to it. She picked it up, walked a safe distance from everyone, and twirled it around her body. Words couldn't describe the beauty of it to her. It felt like an extension of her body, something alive, flowing, and undulating, with a snake-like quality to it. She loved it. Sensei, please, can I keep it? 
Enko noted the reverence in the girl's face and smiled. It was one of her favorites as well. It takes a lot of practice to use it effectively, Haruno, but I believe you are capable of it. Kakashi strolled over to one of the dummies and studied it for a moment. Ma, they're very realistic. I must congratulate you. May I? Please do. Kakashi stepped closer to it. He clenched his hand as the sound of a thousand chirping birds filled the air. Every girl in the class stopped what they were doing to watch the elite ninja systematically destroy the dummy. None had ever witnessed a ninja of his caliber perform before. They saw the dummy electrocuted, stabbed, pummeled with water, crushed with a massive earthen wall, and then burned to an unrecognizable mass in seconds. The girls simply stared in shock at the raw display of power. Anko quickly got their attention back to their task at hand by waving the clippers in the air and cheerfully asking, who's first? At the end of the lesson, the winded girls were each handed a piece of paper for their parents to sign. It was for their next lesson, a campout. That sounds like fun, chirped Sakura. Where's training ground 44? 13 months ago. Naruto wiped the slick moisture from his brow again. How can it be so damn hot? He thought to himself, it's not even summer yet. The weather had been abnormally hot lately, even for the land of waterfalls. It was so hot, he was starting to worry that his brains would broil in his skull. He readjusted his pack and slowly trudged on. The resistance seals had just been made stronger yet again this morning. He felt the constant drain on his chakra pulling at him. Pervy Sage is a sadist, he thought, sending a dark look at the man he still admired greatly. He was so thirsty. They all were. As he unconsciously put one foot in front of the other, he wondered if he would fall. He didn't want to fall. It was a matter of pride. Jiraiya told him this leg of the journey would be difficult, but he thought nothing of it. Now he knew differently. Sanade was walking next to Sai. She had been talking to him about mind-numbingly boring medical jutsu during their travels, but they too had fallen silent to conserve their strength. Sasuke was next to him, blindfolded. He was working on expanding his senses. Every now and then, Naruto would toss a rock at him to screw with him. That team always seemed to sense it though. Sighing, Naruto pulled the rubber ball from his pocket and tried to pop it using his chakra. So far, he had no luck. The water balloon was definitely easier. I hear water, said Sasuke, pulling off his blindfold. He looked around, searching for proof of what he had sensed. He thought he smelled the faint hint of minerals and lake weeds, but all around them was tall boulders and rising canyons. Everything was dull and brown. Scabby parch weeds dotted the ground. Was I wrong? He asked aloud, beginning to have doubts. No, it won't be long now, responded Jiraiya wearily. He wasn't used to traveling through this miserable part of the country so slowly. The sun crushed heavily on them the whole way. Even when it turned and inflamed, turbulent red at sunset, it shined defiantly down through the hills to their left, blinding them. Every drop of sweat inching down their burning skin pained them. The coolness of the canyon they entered made them sigh in relief, and a half an hour later, they all heard it. The rumble of water, sweet life-giving water. Naruto licked his parched lips and walked faster, nearly tripping over his feet in his haste to see this miracle. The next turn opened into a wide green field. A mammoth lake sparkled in the sun and drew them like moss to a flame. They dunked their heads into the cool, refreshing water and drank deeply. As he lifted his dripping face, he stared in awe of the waterfall. The huge column of water seemed to stretch endlessly into the sky. In truth, Naruto thought the clouds were touching the tip of the mountain. The roar of the water drowned out all other sound as they shouted to be heard over it. A watery haze shrouded the entire area due to the power of the falls. Droplets of water and the rays of the sun merged in a passionate embrace to create a rainbow bridge that sliced the sky above and came diving down into the lake below. All three boys gasped in wonder at the sight. It looked as though they could reach out their hands, touch the seven-colored miracle, and feel the airy fragility of this bridge in the sky. It's amazing, said the unusually hushed blonde boy. He sighed contentedly, catching the fresh spray on his face. Can we get in for a quick dip? Please, Pervy Sage? No, we are here. So I looked around intriguingly. I don't see any village. That's because it's hidden, Aho, replied Sasuke sarcastically. So how do we get in? asked Naruto. Right through there, replied Jiraiya, pointing at the pounding water. Just follow me. An instant later, he and Tsunade leaped at the base of the waterfall and disappeared. At least we're getting wet, shouted Naruto enthusiastically before following the Sani. It was a strange thing to blindly leap through the air, not knowing where the ground was. The pounding waters blinded him, so when he felt something snatch him from the air and wrap around itself around him in a tight grip, he gave a small squeak of fright. 
A deep chuckle reverberated against his chest, and a familiar voice teased, Scared Gaki? Or did you step on a mouse? Naruto, beyond humiliated, blinked the water from his eyes and scowled. I wasn't scared, pervy sage. That was just my, my sandal. It's wet. Hmm. He said doubtfully, and then set the boy down. Sanade caught Sasuke in her arms, and Jiraiya grabbed Sai. Neither one seemed surprised at being caught in the Sanin's arms, which caused Naruto to scowl even deeper. Once Naruto's eyes adjusted to the dim lighting, he was surprised to discover he was in an enormous cavern filled with small water-filled holes. Sai and Sasuke stood beside him, glancing around curiously. Pay attention, boys, said Jiraiya, shaking them out of their reverie. Some of these holes are traps and some are dead ends. Either way, you'll drown if you choose to go in the wrong one. They trailed him over to a bean-shaped one, which he dove into. Naruto took a big breath and followed. It seemed like he swam forever in the twisted underwater tunnels. His lungs burned for oxygen. Just when he thought he wouldn't be able to hold his breath much longer, there was a light ahead. He furiously kicked his legs and broke through the surface of the lake, taking huge gulps of air. Sai and Sasuke bobbed up next to him an instant later, doing the same. Directly ahead was the biggest tree the boys had ever seen. At first glance, it looked like an ordinary tree, like one of the thousands they had seen in their travels, but there was something special about this one. They felt something odd. The tree seemed almost sentient. Wow, they whispered. Naruto tugged on Jiraiya's arm and quietly asked, What is it? You can feel it, huh? It's a very special tree. It creates the hero's water. What's that? Later, he said, we have a very important mission right now. Jiraiya and Sanade climbed to the top of the water and walked across the lake towards the tall man that stood at the edge. The boys, remembering the reason they were there, assumed somber expressions and hastily followed suit. The man rushed forward to the sand knee. Worry was evident on his face. Jiraiya, thank Kami you came. Is this Lady Sanade? I am the village's Jonin leader, Shirbaku. I wish I could give you a proper greeting, but time is of the essence. That's all right, interjected Sanade. Show me and my apprentice where they are. Until I discover the nature of the disease these people have, I want the rest of you to stay away. Sasuke and Naruto exchanged concerned looks with Sai and nodded. They nervously watched him leave with the slug Sani. Jiraiya clapped his hands on the remaining boys and drew them away. They walked towards a large house that stood in the middle of the village. A very old wrinkled lady came out and greeted them. Jiraiya boy, nice to see you again. Have you got room for a few extras, old mother? He asked fondly. Of course, she beamed while ushering them inside. Sanade and Sai made their way to the makeshift infirmary that had been quickly erected after most of the townspeople began to fall ill. The village was too small to support a hospital and had only two healers. Things were looking very dire. Sanade stopped at the entrance of the rough wooden building and grabbed two masks from the table that stood beside the door. She handed one to Sai before entering. The scroll detailing the medical emergency didn't prepare Sai for what he witnessed. The odor of decaying flesh hit his nostrils through the mask, making him feel instantly nauseous. Most of the victims had opened, weeping sores all over their bodies. A small child lay in the first bed. She was crying out for her parents in a hoarse, raspy plea that went unanswered. Her pitiful cries filled his heart with pity and sorrow. He stood there, trying to take deep, even breaths to calm himself. Sonade took his hand in hers and gave him a quick, reassuring squeeze. We are here and we will help them, she said encouragingly. Sai stood up straighter. In a firm voice, he asked, What do you want me to do? She handed him a bag. You can start by gathering samples. Naruto and Sasuke couldn't help but love the sweet old woman immediately. She fed them and sked over the worn state of their clothes all while keeping a running commentary about the village and its current state of emergency. Since they were going to be there for quite a few weeks at least, Jiraiya set up a training schedule for them. As he handed them the scrolls, Naruto studied his with a frown on his face. Um, pervy sage, when am I supposed to sleep? Right here, he said, pointing out the four-hour slot. Four hours? That's all I get. Eh, it's just for the week. It's combat training. Naruto frowned for a minute before brightening. He pulled a scroll from his bag and held it towards his godfather. Can you send this to Sakura? He asked. It's almost her birthday, and I wanted her to have these jutsu. As Jiraiya took it, Sasuke scoffed. Why would you give that away? Naruto growled. Don't even say it team. I got it from Kakujo when we were in the land of vegetables. It's mine to give and besides, it's just a bunch of flower jutsus. Who better to have it than Sakura? Isn't it rather dangerous to use your entire vocabulary in one sentence? Timi. Baka. All right, you too. 
knock it off. Jiraiya put the scroll away and then stepped between the boys. He made a shadow clone to lead Sasuke over to one corner of the training field while he led Naruto to another. It's time I finish teaching you your father's jutsu. Naruto had been feeling off all evening. He felt anxious and jittery for some unknown reason. At first, he thought that maybe he was worried about Sai, but when the boy joined them that night, he still didn't feel any better. It wasn't long before he excused himself to go to bed. Sai and Sasuke followed him soon after. When they entered the room several minutes later, they found him sitting on the window seat, staring pensively out into the night. Honestly, Baka, what's wrong with you? You better not say nothing because we know better. Naruto turned and gave them a perplexed look. I really don't know. I feel weird. I don't know. Like something's about to happen. Something big. What? Like something dangerous? Asked Sai. He hesitated before answering. Yes. No. I don't know. Sasuke considered Naruto's words before responding, I would think that if something bad was about to happen, Jiraiya or Sanade would feel it too. Just forget about it for now and go to sleep. Naruto nodded with a little reluctance. He stripped down to his boxers and laid down on the futon to sleep for the night. The other boys had just settled down when he bolted up and clenched his chest as if in pain. Seconds later, their door was kicked down and a young woman with short spiky mint green hair ran into the room. Her wild, orange-colored eyes searched the room until they fell upon Naruto. Before they could even pull out weapons to defend themselves, she shouted, You. Is it you, isn't it? Is what me? Asked the confounded boy. It is you, she said as though in shock. Jiraiya came running into the room, and then abruptly halted at the sight of the woman. Fu, what are you doing in here? I heard you weren't expected back until sometime late tomorrow. She gave a small, respectful bow and then asked, Is he really? Yes. How did you know? Comey, I, she said simply. The boys sent baffled looks at each other, then scrambled out of their beds as she suddenly gave a loud, excited whoop, raced forward, picked up Naruto, swung him around in a circle, and kissed him full on the mouth. Jiraiya laughed and sent a wink to the blonde. He strolled out of the room, leaving them alone with the crazy Kunoichi. Sasuke held out a kunai and demanded, Leave him alone. Naruto just stood there in a daze when she sat him down. She turned to Sasuke and asked derisively, What do you care what happens to him? You probably hate him. TCH, I don't hate him. He's my best friend. And mine as well, interjected Sai. Friend, she snorted. Yeah, right. Nobody is friends with a Jinchuriki. She added sullenly, Everybody knows that they are monsters. Hey, shouted Naruto, I am not a monster. A look of comprehension crossed Sai's face. He said, A monster is an imaginary creature that is typically large, ugly, and frightening. While I might agree that Naruto is ugly, he is neither large nor frightening. Hey, yelled Naruto. That is sarcasm. He added smugly. I've been working on it. Keep working on it. Aho, uh -oh, muttered Naruto. Who are you, and what do you want? Demanded Sasuke. She is obviously a Jinchuriki. I mean, really, are you always this ignorant? Naruto ignored their squabbling as he looked at her in wonder. Are you really? Is that why I've been feeling weird today? Yeah. I felt it too, the closer I got to Takigakure. Komei, my biju, felt your presence and warned me. You talk to it? Fu smiled and asked, you don't. Naruto gave her an odd look at that statement, not knowing how to respond. In truth, it had never occurred to him that the QB would actually be capable of speech. The mere idea of it made him feel a little apprehensive. Sasuke and Sai seemed to feel his anxiety and moved close enough to brush their skin against his. Fu noticed their subtle movement and was taken aback by what it implied, something she had thought impossible. So these two are really your friends, she softly asked in astonishment. And they know what you are? Yeah, they're my best friends and brothers. Fu managed to shock the boys into utter silence as she ran up to them and gave them the same greeting she had given to Naruto. Sasuke was not able to mask the red flush that crept up his face as the beautiful girl hugged him tight against her breasts and kissed him on the mouth. One week later, Sai's hands glowed green over the little girl's chest. She coughed weakly then gave him a shy smile. Where's your mommy at? She asked. She is at home in Kanahagakur with my father. Do you miss her? Sometimes. I miss my daddy and my brother. They're not allowed to come in here because they might get sick too. I miss my mommy too. She used to talk to me, but then she didn't say anything. She just stopped, and I don't know why. The doctors took her away yesterday, and she hasn't come back. Her eyes filled with tears. She grasped Sai's hand with surprising strength and implored him, Can you bring back my mommy to me? I, I do not know. He wanted to say, 
or do something to make her feel better, but was at a loss as to how. He patted her hand awkwardly and said, There, there. Please do not leak fluids from your lacrimal apparatus. What? She sobbed. Don't cry. It makes me feel uncomfortable. But I'm sad and scared. What should I do? Well, whenever I feel that way, I try to do something that makes me happy or I talk to my friends. They will usually make me feel better. I guess you can tell me what makes you happy. The sun always makes me happy, she said weakly. But everything is so dark now, and I'm scared of the dark. My mommy makes me happy too. She is very pretty and nice and... She faltered as another harsh barking cough cut off her words. Blood dribbled down the corners of her mouth while she tried to catch her breath. I don't like being sick. Lady Tsunade is one of the greatest medics in the world. She is finding a cure, and you will get better. Soon, you will be able to play in the sun again. A thick black strand of sweat-soaked hair fell in his face again. Sasuke impatiently shoved it aside as he tried to summon enough chakra to do the great fireball technique one more time. Panting heavily, he took another deep breath, made the horse and tiger seal, and exhaled an enormous inferno. He held it as long as he could before the flaming ball sputtered out. Sections of the rocky mountainside wall were still glowing red from the intense heat, while other parts were burnt black. He knew he was pushing himself too far, but he wanted to be the best. He was in Uchiha, and it was expected of him. He stumbled to the ground as extreme weariness overtook him. Well, that was stupid, teased Jiraiya dryly. Sasuke gave him a sour look as the Sanin continued. Do you even have enough chakra to get back to the house now? Sasuke used his meager supply of chakra to lift his arm and throw a kunai at the smug man. Jiraiya easily dodged it and then, with an amused laugh and wave, dispelled himself. Stupid clone, he muttered to himself before taking a drink of water. As he was lowering the bottle, he heard her approach. Because Fu was related to the village leader, she was not hated by everyone, but she was feared by them. She never had any friends, so for some odd reason, she instantly liked the three boys. She told them that they were her new little brothers and made it her goal in life to treat them that way. Naruto loved it. Sai was bewildered by it all, and Sasuke was annoyed, a little. Fu, he greeted warily. She ran up to the boy, picked him up, and glomped him. He gave a scowl and tried to push her away, but she just cheerfully laughed and tousled his hair. Did you miss me, cutie pie? She asked impishly. Will you stop calling me that already? I am a shinobi, not some little child, he hissed as he tried to regain his dignity. You are more annoying than the Baka sometimes. You're a jonin, so you should act like it. Ah, you say that, but you don't mean it. And besides, you're not a shinobi yet. Yes, I do mean it. Sasuke huffed and sat back down. So how was your mission, he asked, knowing it was useless to discourage her. Fu answered, boring. How has your training been? He pointed at the wall behind him in answer. Very nice, little brother, she complimented. Of course, I am in Uchiha, he said self-importantly. Fu stuck out her tongue, slapped him upside the head, and then pulled him to his feet. Come on, little brother, she said in a chipper voice. Stop being so conceited. I'm starving, and you get the honor of buying me lunch. Oh joy. The Rasengan. Naruto stood in the field next to his summoned clone. This time, he thought. This I'll do it for sure. His hands were aching and bleeding from all the chakra burns and explosions, but he never gave up. He bet Sanade that he would finish it in a week so that she would stop trying to stomp on his dream of being Hokage. He had to do it. He had to show her that he was smart and capable. He had to show her his will of fire. One more time, he said to himself again. This I'll do it for sure. Thrusting out his palm, he gathered his chakra until a glowing untamed mass appeared. The clone's hands rotated around it until it became a violent sphere in the center of his hand. A shriek emanated from the glowing blue chakra. Rasengan! shouted Naruto as he slammed it into a nearby tree, sending splinters and chunks of wood flying. He stood staring at the crater in the tree. With a loud crack, it toppled down and slammed into the ground, the vibrations tickling the boy's feet. I did it. I did it. I knew I could do it, he shouted ecstatically. The noise in the field dropped as all the other clones stopped training to look at the fallen tree. A rush of noise filled Naruto's ears as the clones began to shout and cheer. He turned to the tall Jiraiya clone next to him and said, I've got to go show Granny. Sasuke and Fu were sitting alone at the food stand when he asked her, Why did you lie to Naruto? What are you talking about? When you said that the Nanabai, Komiai was your friend, you lied. I could tell. You're just a kid. You wouldn't understand. I am not a kid. I'm a shinobi. Tell me the truth. Fu studied Sasuke for a minute before answering. Being a Jinchuriki is a curse. 
It leaves you with a hole in your heart. Comey, I, and I get along all right, but we can never be friends because I resent it too much. It is because of the beast that I am feared and hated for the power contained within me. As I said, you can never truly understand what that feels like. Sasuke sneered. You think I don't know what that feels like? My father was a traitor. It was kept quiet, but there is no such thing as a secret in a ninja village. I am looked at as a son of a traitor by some. His voice grew louder as he got angrier. The rest of the villagers see me as only in Uchiha. There are so many expectations placed on me. They know nothing of me or who I am. I understand Naruto better than anyone can. I lied to him because I don't want him to be hurt. He has been blessed with friends to fill the hole that the QB cost. It is a struggle to keep the biju contained. I want him to have hope that it is possible. I have heard that some Jinchuriki have been able to befriend their biju and control them. Fu leaned close to the boy and gave him a kiss on the cheek. Naruto is really lucky to have you as his friend. How I wish I had it too, she whispered regretfully. You are our friend, Fu. In the dim light of the tavern, two old friends sat in companionable silence for a brief moment. The last of the villagers had finally been healed, and all that was left was to wait for them to rest to recover fully and get their strength back. Sonade had left Sai in charge at the infirmary. This place could really use a hospital, she said ruefully. It would have saved lives. Thankfully, you came along. Much more than three would have been lost otherwise. The flickering candle between them sent fluttering moths of light against the numerous sake bottles. The man gave a slight jerk as one of his clones dispelled, then leaned back against the booth with a proud expression on his face followed quickly by a smug one. The woman, catching the telltale gleam in his eyes, demanded, What is it? Oh, I wouldn't want to ruin the surprise. You do know, I hate surprises. This one is pretty special. What is it? She demanded again. It's coming right now, he said with a nod to the opening door. A bright yellow streak of sunshine slammed into the old man with hurricane force. I did it. I did it. I told you I could do it. Yeah, Jiraiya laughed. I was there. Gaki, remember? Naruto swiftly turned to Sanade and said, I told you, Granny. I told you I could do it. I win the bet. The slug Sanin's eye twitched, and her fist clenched. What have I told you about calling me that? Yeah, yeah, but a bet's a bet, he said. Sanade had no idea how it happened or when it happened, but somehow during their travels, that bold, Irreverent little brat wormed his way into her cold heart. There was just something about him that made her want to bet on him. Sai stepped outside and sat down on the cool grass next to a tree. It took nearly a week, but Sanade was able to isolate the disease and create an antidote. He helped her inoculate everyone in the village. They would survive. For days, he had used chakra techniques taught to him by the Sanin to help alleviate their symptoms and prolong their lives. For many, it brought them back from the brink of despair and gave them hope. For some, it was too late. The little girl didn't make it. Mitsuku, child of the light, he thought bitterly as he took a pad of paper from his pack and some paint. What a lie. He began to draw her face, one that was free of the disease that killed her. When he was done, he didn't feel better. He didn't find the peace that often came over him when he was doing what he loved. He was about to crumple up the paper when it was taken from his unresisting fingers. Sonate sat down next to him. She said not a word as she patiently waited for the boy to figure out what he needed to say. I thought she was getting better, he finally said without looking at her. I know. She didn't get better. No, she didn't. Her father and brother are unhappy now. Sonate nodded and said, It's very hard to lose your loved ones. I too am unhappy. Why do I feel this way? What is the purpose of it? I am a ninja. I shouldn't feel anything. People live and people die. It's a part of life. I don't like feeling this way. Sanade put her arm around the boy and said softly, Oh, Sai, we all must know the pain of loss because if we never knew it, we would have no compassion for others. The terrible pain of loss teaches humility to our prideful kind and has the power to soften uncaring hearts and to make a better person of a good one. Sai was silent while he considered her words. She is finally with her mother now, Sensei, isn't she? Yes, she is. I think I can be content with that in time. She handed the drawing back to the boy and asked him to finish it. After careful consideration, he resumed his painting with more emotion than before. Everyone in the village came to the graveyard to say their final goodbyes. Sai stood next to the small plot where they laid the little girl to rest. Her mother was next to her. They were together again. His chest felt tight and heavy. There were no words that came to his mind to say, so he simply laid the picture on the casket and walked away. It was his way of saying goodbye. Naruto and Sasuke both put their arms around him. 
That was a nice thing to do, commented Sasuke. Yeah, agreed Naruto, it was. The man who had been silently grieving picked it up and smiled through his tears. He clenched it tight to his chest for a moment, then showed it to the young boy who looked so achingly similar to his sister. Mitsuka was held in the arms of her mother. They were so happy. They were laughing in the sun. Thank you, he whispered. Tsunade and Jiraiya were also at the funeral paying their respects when the leader, Shirbaku, approached them. Milady, I just got an urgent plea for aid. It seems some of the lower villages have been stricken with the same disease. Tsunade packed her things and left to travel to the other villages. She left Sai to continue looking after the weakened people. Jiraiya hastily departed the next day due to unforeseen circumstances in the nearby country of Amagekir. He had a very important meeting with one of his contacts. As he stood near the lake with his packed bags, he informed the trio, continue with your training and help the villagers as much as you can until I return. I should only be a week or two at most. When I return, we will leave for the summoning islands. What about Lady Tsunade? Asked Sai. She has agreed to return to Kanahagakur when she is done. One week later, the sun was burning high in the sky when they stopped their training to have lunch. They were practicing some of their more destructive jutsu, so they were not in the village. Instead, they were at the base of the falls beside the massive lake. They were halfway through eating when a rustling in the nearby bushes alerted them to danger. Sasuke hissed, shut up and listen. He yanked out his giant windmill shuiken while Naruto and Sai stood alert and ready with their kanai in hand. An injured woman stumbled towards them with two young children. Sai grabbed her as she fell. Please help. There's been an attack, she gasped out. Sai pulled out the shuriken embedded in her back and healed the wound. How many are there? He asked. I. I don't know. Maybe eight or ten. It happened so fast. She began to cry, feeling useless and fearing the worst. The children held on to their mother in fright. Shuh, it's okay, lady, comforted Naruto, we'll handle it. But you're just children, she wailed. No, said Naruto gravely, we are shinobi. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content. Click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.